All right. Praise the Lord. We'll, we'll open up in prayer. Father, thank you again for your holy word, and thank you that it's true and it's eternal. Thank you, Lord, that your word is everlasting. And, and Father, it always speaks to us, Lord. Thank you, God, that we could come before you, Lord, and you will use your word to heal us. You will use your word to correct us. You will use your word to save those who are not saved. Father, Lord, your word is e efficient. Your word is sufficient. Lord, your, your word, your word is miraculous. And we thank you for it now. Just bring your word to our hearts in an amazing way in Jesus' name. Well, we are here once again in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As, as we look at this Christmas prophecy given through Isaiah some 2,700 years ago, these name hold, names of Jesus hold great significance to us. We, we know that these names are what our Lord will be called at his millennial reign when he comes back again. The world, everyone will know him, will know how he, he rules. They will know him as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. But, you know, we know him this way. For, for the moment we believed in Jesus, the moment we repented of our sin, Jesus Christ came into our hearts and into our lives. And in us right now, he is that wonderful counselor. He is that mighty God. He is that everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. These, these Sundays leading up to Christmas, we're looking at every one of the, these titles that, that has been given to Jesus. And this morning, we're going to look at Jesus, our everlasting Father. Now, this title is probably the most confusing of the four because as stated last week, according to God's own revelation about himself, there is only one true God who eternally and concurrently exists as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is how God has revealed himself. This is, this is how God has explained himself in his holy word, the Bible. And while we know that Jesus is God the Son, the Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus is not God the Father. God the Father is his own person. He's distinct from Jesus, God the Son. And so at first glance, as this prophecy calls, calls Jesus everlasting Father, it seems to confuse the two. But they are not confused they are not he's not speaking of of one person he's he's speaking of Jesus the son of God so I know what you're thinking you're thinking what Ricky Ricardo would say to Lucy you have some explaining to do let me explain what I mean in the Hebrew language the word father Av was used in two different ways the actual way and the symbolic way. The actual or normal way the word father meant was simply to describe a male parent of a child, whether by procreation or by adoption. That word father could refer to the, the, the literal father, it could refer to the grandfather or the great-grandfather, but it is the male parent over a child. It is in this respect that God the Father is actually our Father since he's the source of all things and became our spiritual parent through the regeneration that came about by our salvation. Now, the symbolic word for Father was given by the Jews to the leaders who God had given them to watch over them. Their leaders, their prophets, their priests, and their kings were each called symbolically father. So if you had a prophet, you would rightfully, as a Jewish person, call him your father. If you had a high priest, you would rightfully call him your father. And it would be symbolic, but it would be right. If you had a king over you, you would rightfully call him your father. 
It's symbolic, but it would be right. Well, it's in this way when Isaiah prophesies that Jesus Christ, who is coming as our Messiah, is called the Everlasting Father. Hallelujah. He, he means it in that symbolic way. Now, when we read this Isaiah um, 9-6 prophecy, we know that the focus concerning Jesus has to do with he, he being king. It says in the fifth verse that the government will be upon his shoulders. It says in the seventh verse that, that Jesus' reign will be over the house of David. Hallelujah. But in, in, in actuality, Jesus fulfills all these roles. Jesus is our everlasting father, not only because he's our everlasting king, but also because he's our everlasting prophet, and he's also our everlasting high priest. Let's, let's look at that. Let's look at what this means to us. Our everlasting father. Hallelujah. Let's look at Jesus, for instance. Jesus is our everlasting prophet. The word of God says in Hebrews 1, 1, and uh, the first part of verse 2, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Wow. As our prophet through whom God speaks, you can be sure his word to you will always be a right now word, will always be a, an alive word, will always be a fresh and relevant word. Jesus' word will always be life giving and powerful and transformative and healing. It is how God speaks to us is through Jesus' words. In these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. But I, I know what, what, what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have the Bible and we also have the Holy Spirit. So how can it just be through Jesus Christ? Well, think about it this way. Jesus himself, when he was talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will not speak of his own, but will only speak what he hears. Then Jesus said, he will take what is of mine and make it known to you. When the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, that is Jesus through him whispering to you. When the Holy Spirit leads you in his word, that is Jesus through him leading you in his word. Well, the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the word of God. Here we have these 66 books written by 40 different authors in a time span of about 1,500 to 2,000 years. And it's a miraculous book indeed. But this is the Holy Spirit inspired and anointed, God breathed indeed. But it came from he who is called the word of God, the logos of God. It came from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is our everlasting prophet. See, no matter where you find yourself, what, what kind of circumstances that you're in, no matter how impossible things seem to be before you, his word will lead you in God's word. Jesus, our prophet, leads by his word. And, you know, once you hear it, then we, you need to believe it. If it's going to have the transformative effect on you, if it's going to be the miraculous thing that the Word of God can be for you, you have to not just hear it, but then you have to believe it. And once you believe it, you have to, you have to act on it. And once you act on it, apply it to your life. You make it a lifestyle. Oh, and when we do, let me tell you, it does amazing things for us. Um, a, a, a friend of mine that's on Facebook happens to be, happens to be, um, used to come to youth group here a million years ago when I was the youth pastor here. Uh, he and his brother and sister, his name is Delton Carter, his, his brother is Mark Carter, his sister is Debbie Carter, wonderful, wonderful people of God, loves Jesus, serving the Lord. Delton had um, just emailed me the other night and, and was talking about how 
you know, he loved the Lord and, and, and he just would worship the Lord and would pray all the time, but kind of took like this little vacation from God's work and, and noticed this slump in his life. And he, and he started to pray and, and he said, you know, Lord, give me a hunger again for your word. Oh, what a wonderful prayer. Give me a hunger for your word. And, and God started moving that in his own heart. And in the morning, he started just reading the Word of God. And he did more than read it. He believed it. And he did more than believe it. He, he, uh, he acted on it, and he applied it to his life. And, and, and he said, I started looking forward to just being in the Word of God. And, and he would look forward to going to church and hear the Word of God proclaimed. You know, you and I were saved, the Bible says, by the Word of God. It's a part of our, our spiritual genetic code. We need the Word to be healthy and to be alive and to be living and, and, and to be who God has called us to be. Well, he started getting in the Word, and, 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 and his words were, I started having divine encounters with God. I started having these grace awakenings, these, these, these miracles that just started happening. It, it, it wasn't something special. That's normal when you and I are in the Word of God. Hallelujah. You know, I do marriage counseling, and, and, and when, when there's troubles with a Christian husband and a Christian wife, the thing that I do is I take them to the Word of God, and I don't take them to the normal passage, everybody everybody thinks that that you know you would go. You know you normally you would think, well, they have some problems. Take them to Ephesians four, where it says, "Husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. Wives love love your husbands as the church um, loves Christ and, and is submitted to Christ." Well, I don't take them there. That's the last place they go. The first place I take them to is I take them to where the Word of God calls Christians to act like Christians to one another. I take them to those one another verses. And I ask them to not only just study them up, but to start practicing them with each other. Start practicing the encourage one another daily so that you will not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Greet one another. Um, pray for one another. Uphold one another, forbear one another's idiosyncrasies, those kinds of verses. And, and the amazing thing that happens is as, as, as Christians, as they start obeying and responding to God's word, something starts happening in their own hearts towards their spouse. A miracle starts taking place. But you know what? If things don't happen... When things don't happen, I notice it's because they're not obeying God's word. Let, 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 me, let me just share something with you that I've noticed through the years. When a Christian husband and a Christian wife has unresolved conflicts. Now listen, everyone will have fights and everyone will have conflicts. This is just part of living. But when it becomes unresolved, when it becomes marriage problem. It's usually not about the marriage at all. It's usually about their Christianity. It's usually about, are you, are you obeying God's word on a daily basis towards your spouse, towards other people? That's where it needs to get fixed. Really, really. You know, Jesus is our everlasting prophet. He leads by his word. He speaks God's word. He gives God's word. That's why when Moses was about ready to leave this earth, God had spoken to Moses and told him that he was not going to go into the promised land. Moses was prophetically speaking before he left. Moses said in Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord God shall raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your own countrymen, then he said, you shall listen to him. Hallelujah. With such leadership from our prophet, no wonder why Jesus is called everlasting father. Hallelujah. Now Jesus is also called our everlasting priest. He is our high priest. 
You know, you know, in Hebrews 5.14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. You know, as our high priest, his, his personal ministry and his, and his personal help will always be available to us without prejudice. Read it, read it. It's in the book of Hebrews. Think about it. Jesus is our high priest. His help and his ministry to us will always be without prejudice. How wonderful is that? We, we can never wear out his compassion. We can never wear out his mercy. And we can never wear out his sympathy. The Bible says that he, he understands, as our high priest, he understands our weaknesses because he too was tempted but was without sin. He was able to endure the temptation without one inkling of sin. But because he was tempted, that he is able to help us in our temptations. And he's, he he's able to help us gain victory over not only our temptations, but over our, our sinful issues. Hallelujah for a great high priest. You know, God, God's love for us has placed this intrinsic value on us. The fact that we have Jesus in our life, there's this intrinsic value in us. I, I, was, I was reading this um, the other day, this, this, this illustration. There was a guy who was trying to share with the crowd what it means to have intrinsic value. So what he did was he took a $100 bill, brand new fresh $100 bill, out of his wallet, and he, and he said to the crowd, who would like this $100 bill? Well, of course, everyone. They just all started raising their hands. And so he said, really? And then he took that $100 bill and he crumpled the $100 bill up and he put that $100 bill on the podium and he just smashed it with his fists, all crumpled up, all wrinkled up, all just, just in this little knot. And then he said to the crowd, who now would like this $100 bill? Every one of them raised their hand. He goes, really? So he took that little crumpled, wadded up $100 bill, threw it on the ground, put his foot on it, and just smushed it under his foot, got it all dusty, got it all dirty, picked it back up, said, now who wants the $100 bill? They still, they all raised their hand. He said, really? So he unwadded this dirty, crumply old $100 bill, and he took a little pin and he started poking holes in it. He says, now who wants this $100 bill? They still raise their hand. He goes, really? And he, and he finally, he started ripping the $100 bill. He says, now do you want it? Now who wants this old, beat up, dirty, ripped up, hole poked $100? Who wants this? And they all raise their hands. You know why? Because no matter what happened to that $100 bill, it retained its intrinsic value. It was still worth $100. God sees you this way. Because God's love sees you this way. He has given you a high priest. It doesn't matter how beat up you've gotten, how smushed up you've gotten, how dirtied up you've gotten, how many holes you got poked into you, how ripped up you've gotten, you have intrinsic value to your wonderful Father God. So he has, has given you Jesus as your high priest. And because you have Jesus as your high priest, as long as you go to him, though you fall, as long as you fall to him, Though you fail, as long as you fail before him, let me tell you, he won't reject you, but he'll be there to minister to you. He'll pick you up. He'll correct what needs to be corrected. He'll clean what needs to be clean. Hey, he'll speak truth in the areas where we're, where we're deceived, and he'll keep um, changing us from the inside out. But you know what? We'll still have that intrinsic value. We'll still be loved by God. We'll still be accepted by the Lord. Oh, we have a great high priest who sees to it. You know, that's why it says in Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood 
Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. I love the way the King James puts it. He is able to save us to the uttermost. Hallelujah. Because he always lives to intercede for them. With such a ministry from our high priest, no wonder why Jesus is called our everlasting father. Oh, we have an everlasting prophet. We have an everlasting priest. But Jesus is also our everlasting king. Get to know the sight. Get to, get to know it from the word. Put it in your minds because you're going to see it with your own eyes. If you love Jesus, if you're, if you're one of his Christians, you're going to see it. Revelation 19, 16, Jesus is coming back again and it says, And on his robe and on his thigh, he, Jesus, had this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Did you know, because Jesus is our everlasting king, we need not ever worry that his kingdom, his authority, his agenda it will ever, ever end. Listen, kingdoms come and go. World leaders rise and they fall. Human governments become dominant and then they diminish. Cultures themselves begin and they end, but Jesus as king... And, and, and sovereign ruler will remain supreme. Tell me what country. Tell me what culture. Tell me what circumstance. Jesus, our sovereign ruler, our sovereign king, cannot enter into and cannot save those who seek him. You know, one of the most glorious passages in, and promises in, in, in the Word of God is found in Revelation chapter 7. There John sees before the throne of God all these people. He says, more than anyone can count in their white robes. And the angel said to or the elder said to John, who are these? And John says, I do not know, sir. Who, you, you tell me, who are they? He says, these are they who came out of the great tribulation. Oh, so many who are saved, so many who have come out. But what's amazing is, is not only is it so many that you couldn't count them, but it says they have come out from every nation, every tribe, every language, every culture. I want you to think about this. Jesus will have his inheritance. There is not a culture, a tribe, a language where Jesus cannot enter in and save by God's grace. Hallelujah. You know, we can have security in this that no matter what our society or government is doing or anybody else is doing, his kingdom comes and his will is going to be done. Now, there's a lot of us who are concerned with what has been called the fiscal cliff. That's that invisible cliff that if our government doesn't do something with um, stopping our spending and raising taxes, that we're not going to be able to we're not going to be able to pay off the deficit. Well, it's my opinion personally that we're we're not approaching the fiscal cliff. We've already free fallen. Give give you an example of that. Um, I heard from um, Chuck Smith gives this illustration concerning what a trillion dollars is, what, what a, the number trillion, just so we could wrap our mind around it. He said, if I borrowed $100 from you and told you I would pay you back in one million seconds, he said, do it, because one million seconds is only 11 days. However, if I borrowed that $100 from you and turned around and told you I would pay you back in one billion seconds, you better think it through. Because one billion seconds is actually 32 years. Million? Billion. But then he said, but if I borrowed $100 from you and told you, wait a minute, I'll pay you back in one trillion seconds. You better not do it. Because one trillion seconds is 32,000 years from now. The difference between a trillion 
and a billion and a million. And we're coming up to $16 trillion in debt. Scary, isn't it? But brothers and sisters, you shouldn't feel insecure. You shouldn't allow your eyes to be on what our world, our government, our fiscal stuff is doing. Don't allow the news to become an idol to you. Because our debt is not bigger than Jesus' kingdom. No matter what happens here in these United States, his kingdom will come. His will will be done. And the word of God says, as long as we get behind him and we get behind his kingdom, that we seek first his kingdom, we seek first his righteousness, all these things that he has to provide for us will be ours. Oh, listen, there's wisdom in storing and stocking things. There always is. The word of God tells us to do that. It's in the book of Proverbs. But don't do it out of fear. Do it out of wisdom. Look to Jesus. Look to his kingdom. Look to his ability to provide. Oh, the word of God says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or her seed begging for bread. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, that's why it says in Matthew 6, 33, let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you as well. Such security from our king. No wonder why Jesus is called our everlasting father. Oh, how blessed are we. Brothers and sisters, because Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Because we accepted Jesus on his terms. We turned from our sinful ways. We repented and said, Lord, I will follow you. I will put my faith in you as my Savior. I will put my faith in you as the Lord who, who now commands me. I'll put my faith in you as my God whom I will worship. Because we have done this with Jesus, he's now living inside of us. He is our everlasting Father. He, as our everlasting prophet, is leading us by his word. He, as our everlasting high priest, is cleaning us and changing us from the inside out and, 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 and picking us up when we fall. And he, as our everlasting king, is giving us the security we need to continue to serve him in such a time as this. If you don't know Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, if you have not come to Jesus on his terms, would you do so this morning? Would you just tell him, Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Lord, this morning, I just want to turn from walking and living for me and walking and living for my sins, and I want to turn right now. And in faith, I put my trust in you as my Savior and in faith, Lord, I will obey you as my Lord. And in faith, I will now worship you as my God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Praise you for your word. It is so true. It is so encouraging. It is so right. Thank you, Jesus, for being our ever lasting Father. Amen.